So I'll just start by saying I was um, honoured but also very surprised to be asked to talk at a career entitled, at a conference entitled Exceedingly Good Careers. And I'm very uneasy about the idea of anyone here thinking that I'm holding myself up as any kind of example. Because the truth is, in some ways, I think of myself more as a, an NHS anti-hero, as, as an example of how not to do it, than as somebody who should be handing out advice. For starters, I'm not a consultant. Despite having been a doctor for 15 years now, um, I'm still that slightly unmentionable thing, a staff grade surgeon. And there's nothing amazing about the surgery I do. I know that people out there in the, the lay world think that a surgeon is some kind of amazing, life-saving, ER, Grey's Anatomy type character. And when I was a junior doctor and very much wanting to go into surgery, I had all sorts of visions of cracking chests open and curing cancer and doing all sorts of sort of really very big things that were going to make me feel enormously important. And the truth is that the surgery that I do now is exclusively local anaesthetic surgery, um, nearly all on skin cancers, usually on the head and neck, but I can kind of roam around the body a bit as well. And I can't even claim that I put the 100 plus hours a week in that when I qualified in 2000, I did as a junior doctor and was always very ready to boast about to my non-medical friends because, again, the reality is that I spend Thursdays working for the NHS and that's all I do now. And if I tell you what I'm doing for the rest of the days in my week, things start to look really wonky. As has been said here, I work part-time as a DV presenter on BBC Two's Trust Me, I'm a Doctor, which in front of a medical audience feels slightly like being announced as a prostitute. <laughs> uh, we all know what we think of media doctors. I, I've, I've been kind of on the other side, so I always feel really ashamed of kind of owning up to that in front of people who actually work in hospitals, because we all know that if you're on the telly looking like you work in a hospital, you're not actually working in a hospital. <laughs> I've written a couple of books, um, one non-fiction and one, fi one fiction, and I've got a lot of satisfaction from having published those books, but I have to say that only this morning before coming here, I opened up an envelope from my publishers in America, which was there to remind me that I still have to pay back by selling books $67,000 before I make a single cent on royalties. So. The broadsheet newspapers were very kind about what I've written, but I'm certainly not J.K. Rowling or whoever that dreadful woman is who made all that money out of Fifty Shades of Grey, who I'm just so jealous of. <laughs> and on top of all of this, I've got way more children than is sensible for anybody who's handing out advice to, as I can see here, a largely fem female audience. I've got four children, um, including twins and one-year-old twins, and uh, if this was a different sort of conference, I would be saying stop at two to anyone, <laughs> to anyone who wants to know when it gets really desperate. It's around four. Um, so what the hell am I doing here? And what do I have to say to any of you guys? Well, I think in all seriousness that if I have any credentials at all for standing up here and giving advice or telling you about what I've done, it's this, my credentials are that there was a time in my life, a little bit like Elizabeth was saying, when no one thought that I was going to be a doctor, least of all myself. And the idea of becoming a doctor, for me, seemed like the most exciting thing that a person could possibly be. And then shortly after that, about six years later, I became a doctor. And remember that feeling of becoming a doctor, feeling like a dream come true. And then sometime after that, and I can't say exactly when that point was, I completely lost my sense of joy in being a doctor and in my medical career. I think it happened sort of slowly and gradually, and it reached a point where I just thought, I don't know why I went into this, I've completely lost my mojo. And my response to that, although it took me a while, was to change things in a way that means that I can now say that my NHS job, even though it's very tiny, is something that brings me an enormous sense of satisfaction. 
So just to try and unpick what made it go bad and what made it get better again, I think that the two principles that sort of govern the times in my career where I felt low and the times in my career where things seem to be picking up again are two things, and they are being told no and being prepared to change something in a way that often felt a bit risky. Now, the being told no thing was there right from the outset for me. I, um, I was good at English and languages at school, terrible at maths and science, and I actually went to a school where no one did science, really. I gave up sciences before O-levels, as they were then, and just did my, my, did my one biology, which you had to do, because you had to do one science. I was in the bottom set at maths. And I really followed what everyone expected that I would do, which was to get through school and go off to university to read English literature. And sometime during that four years that I spent getting my English degree, I started thinking that I wanted to be a doctor, which was really out of the blue. No one in my family did medicine. It was completely bizarre for me to want to do something like that. There was no one who I'd seen go through an illness that had changed my life. And when I announced to my father, having just got my English degree, that I wanted to get whatever qualifications I needed in order to go to medical school, he was categorically negative and said, no way, I'm not funding it, you're a words person, not a numbers person. And um, it made me quite angry that he thought that. So <laughs> I sort of decided that I was going to prove him wrong. And I went off and with enormous difficulty got by science A-levels and then joined a graduate programme like Elizabeth. Again, not as pioneering as the one that Elizabeth joined, but there were only 10 of us on my graduate programme at King's back then. And the guy who took me on said, you are the least qualified medical student in the country. <laughs> Um, being told no certainly didn't stop there. I went through medical school pretty much under the radar because once I got in, no one really knew that I was different to anyone else. But when it came to wanting to apply for a surgical rotation, I was 30 years old when I qualified as a doctor. And I remember all my consultants saying, you're a woman, you're 30, you've left it too late, you can't do this. And um, I, I struggled to get invited for surgical rotation interviews until I decided to make use of the fact I'd done an English degree and I slightly changed the organisation of my CV so that I put right on the front page in really big font that my um, English literature thesis had been written on the subject of sadomasochism in the Gothic novel. <laughs> and then suddenly the invitations flooded in. <laughs> At the interview that I actually got the job for, one of the gentlemen on the all-male panel did a calculation for me where he said, you're 30, you're going to be 31 when you finish being a house officer, you'll be about 33 or 34 when you're done with being an SHO, you're going to be 40 when you're a consultant. How do you plan to make that work? So I said to him, I guess I'll just have to marry someone rich then. I went through the ranks, I did my basic surgical training, and at the end of what felt like quite a hard slog, I ended up with a very lovely job as an ENT registrar at St George's Hospital. And I felt really that this was the point where all that hard work that I'd done was kind of coming to fruition and I should be feeling really proud of myself. And it coincided with the fact I'd found someone to settle down with, I had a child, and I thought everything's meant to feel perfect. And yet, for some strange reason, this was the time where things started to feel not quite as they should. For some reason, I felt dissatisfied. I started finding the kind of hierarchy of surgery which I had accepted completely up until that point very infantilizing. I think that had something to do with becoming a mother. I suddenly felt much less able to accept being ordered around when I was in control and having to look after someone else's life. And I also remember a distinct feeling of almost starting to act like a surgeon rather than feel like a surgeon. I remember one of my bosses at St George's saying one evening at about five o'clock that someone had just come in as an emergency and one of us registrars could stay a couple of extra hours and he'd let us do one of the operations on this man without any assistance. 
And I knew it was an enormous privilege, and I knew that in order to keep up appearances, that I had to fight for this position to be the one that got to stay and do the surgery. And I was also aware that inside I was thinking, I really don't want to stay, I just want to go home, I want to watch the telly, I want to see my kids. And that was a real moment for me that I didn't forget. I also felt, as an ENT surgeon, seeing a lot of children, that I had more contact with other people's children than I did with my own child, and that troubled me. Um, I think, worst of all, I looked up to my consultant colleagues, and I had, by this stage, gone part-time as a surgeon. I was doing three days a week, and it was going to take me a further 10 years to become a consultant. And I looked up to my consultant colleagues, and I thought, I'm impressed by what you do, but I actually don't want to be you. I don't want the life that you have. So, like any decent feminist, I decided to solve the problem the responsible way. I got pregnant, <laughs> had a baby, and went to Australia for six months. And I spent a good deal of that six months, in between changing nappies and all the rest of it, trying to resolve what I was going to do about, about my surgical career. I also started writing at this time. And the crux moment for me in terms of my sort of decision about surgery and where to go next came when I flew back into Heathrow with my daughter, who was about seven months old at that time. And it was snowing in London and very, very quiet. And even though I had decided when talking to my husband that I would go back and be a registrar for another six months and see how things went, I just had this moment of looking out the window in the taxi going back home and thinking, I'm not doing it anymore, or I'm not doing it this way anymore. I realised that I wanted to carry on being a doctor, but that I didn't want to carry on on the path that I had set for myself. So I went into the hospital, and to everyone's astonishment, I resigned from my, from my surgical position, from my registrar training number that I had fought really hard to get. All the consultants said I was completely mad, and it felt a bit like hearing no all over again. And then a few nice things happened. I sent off part of my manuscript and got an advance to write my book. I got in touch with an old ENT colleague who'd become a consultant at a district general hospital, told him what I'd done, and again, serendipitously, like Elizabeth was saying, they needed a staff grade ENT surgeon around that time, and I was invited for an interview for that job. This interview felt very different than all the ones that had come before it, because although the job that I was going for on the face of it was a lowly job with a tiny salary, no career progression, and absolutely no status, I felt like I was myself again. I even took my daughter with me, and I said to them during that interview, I have given up my position as a registrar with all of the future possibilities that that holds because I want to do something different with my life. I want to write a book, I want to do other things, and I need to get that on the table now so that you're not expecting me just to be a smaller version of what I was before. I agreed during that interview as well to do lots of skin cancer work, which was something I had never envision, envisioned for myself, but it was something they said they needed. And I'm still there at that hospital now. Now, what I've told you is just one example of how a life in the NHS can be, and each one of you in this room has their own. But what I've learnt from my experience are a few things which I'll share with you, and they might be useful or might not. Number one, what I've learnt is that when someone says no, think laterally, because there may be a way through the obstruction, even if it's not quite the way that you imagined it would be. Number two, find an ally or two. And I think here in this room, there are probably lots of allies right here ready for you now to, to just have someone who you can bounce ideas off when you're thinking that you might want to change direction. Number three, I think it's always worth asking if you're wanting to move up, whatever that means for you, to ask in the organisation that you work in what the needs are. Because sometimes if you find out 
where the spaces are that need filling, you can kind of morph a little bit in order to bring something for yourself that's also sort of being useful for someone else. Number four is a big one for me, which is to admit your lim limitations, but don't allow your limitations to get the better of you. And um, as an example of this, I, I actually can't quite give this example the way I was going to, because uh, I think if I walk away, I'll stop being audible, yes. Um, I went to the Cheltenham Literature Festival recently, and I was on a panel with the wonderful Tanya Byron, the psychologist. And we were all asked to give a few minutes talk and then there were questions. And when it came to Tanya's turn, she had no notes, she had no PowerPoint, she just walked out into the audience and was incredibly charismatic and engaging. And I looked at her and I thought, that's the way to give a talk. And then I heard from the organisers here that there were going to be lots of you and I completely lost my nerve. I wrote my speech down on some paper <laughs> so that I'd have a crutch. And I said to myself that that was okay I could confess that to you all, that I was nervous, but that at some point during this speech that I should walk away, which I'm actually not going to do because you won't be able to hear me, that I would walk away from this lectern here and talk to you directly without any assistance. And hopefully the next time I give a speech, I'll be able to do that a little bit more. And I suppose what I'm trying to say by that is... It's okay that you guys know I'm nervous, but it would have been a real shame if I'd said I wasn't going to give the speech because I'd let the nerves get on top of me. Number five is the most important one, which is, I think, and I've noticed talking to friends of mine who don't work in the NHS, that whether you're a doctor or a nurse or a paramedic or a healthcare assistant, there is something about working in the NHS that has a kind of usefulness to it and a purity to it that most people I know can only dream of. And I think it's really worth remembering that in those moments when you're feeling completely demoralised working for the NHS, and I think we all know that they are plentiful, those moments, that there is something about doing what we do, which is essentially looking after others, which is really, really special. And number six, with that in mind, is try and remember what it was, I guess in my case, when I really wanted to be a doctor, whenever I'm feeling sort of down in the dumps about being a doctor, I remember how much I wanted to be a doctor, what it felt like to want to be a doctor that much. And it almost helps me to kind of get back into the sense of what it was that I was after then. Um, when I'm doing my writing and I get writer's block, I've got a series of tips on my wall that are things that I've read that other writers who are much better than me have said to help you kind of through the dark times. And Margaret Atwood, who's a, a writer I love, basically has this tip that I have above my desk, which is if you get lost in the woods, don't sit down. Retrace your steps, find the point where you lost your way, take the other path, explore the possibilities. What I have now in my career that I value is an interesting life with lots of time with my children. I have lots of autonomy, which I think was something I felt I had completely lost when I was a registrar. I do a mixture of things which together feel valuable. And I have a day in the NHS now which feels completely reinvigorated by the choices that I've made. What I don't have is a consultant job or fancy surgical work. I don't have a TV or book career that are either remotely secure or bring in any money. And I'm never quite sure what work's going to be coming up in the next year. So I suppose in conclusion what I would say is that, in my opinion, satisfying careers come in all shapes and sizes. They often don't follow a conventional path. And finally, from my point of view, there's no such thing as too late in life. I was told I was too old and I was 24. There's no such thing as not clever enough. I was told I couldn't do maths and I still can't, but I still got into medical school. And there's no such thing as not possible. The fact that all of you are here in this room shows that you are each the kind of person who's motivated to improve their career or help someone else to improve their career. And my feeling is probably if someone says no to you, it's them that's wrong. Thank you.